Simplicity, the key to software success. Oh, come on, buddy. All right, who am I? My name is Brian Childress, and I'm from a little suburb of Washington, D.C., known as Richmond, Virginia. Uh, so I came up yesterday, got to fight a lot of the D.C. traffic. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Man. Audience participation. I love it. There we go. Man, we are getting there. All right. I know that I'm the only thing standing between us and lunch. Obviously, I need some lunch, so here we go. Um, like we heard, my name, uh, or I'm a technical advisor with an agency called Summit Labs. I get to work with small and medium businesses, startups, helping them to grow and scale their organizations. So today I want to share a few case studies around projects that I've worked on over the last few years and some of the lessons that were learned from those. I've tried to remove a lot of identifying information to protect the innocent. But first, I want us to start by building something together. We're going to have to move a little bit higher up the stack. We're going to build a simple web application. Is everybody in for that? All right. So it's going to require some participation. I want you to raise your hand for the option that most speaks to you. Again, we're going to build something together. We've got to pick an architecture. Where are my monolithic fans? Who loves a good monolithic architecture? Yeah, I figured. OK, wow, all right. Microservices. We're going to build it for scale. Might as well start from the beginning. There we go. We need a runtime. Node.js, JavaScript fans. Is anyone using Go in production? All right, how's that going for you? Good, good. All right, good. Database, SQL. Relational, right? Everything's related to everything else, might as well. Document, pick your flavor of the week, Mongo, because, yep, OK. Last one, uh, REST. We need a way to get to our data. GraphQL, awesome. Has anybody stopped by the Hashura booth? They uh, had a really good uh, presentation of how they're stitching both together. Cool. Thank you all for your participation. I want to know if anybody was sitting here wondering why. Why is this guy on stage? Why can't he use a computer? Yeah. Right. Um, why are we building this, right? What is this for? I need more information to understand what it is we're building to be able to really answer the questions that you're asking me. And I'm sure some of us said this. Well, it depends. There are a lot of variables at play, a lot of things that we need to consider. So the things you're asking me to decide on, I can't quite do that just yet. Because what I want to share with you is that together, we just built the world's most highly scalable distributed to-do list application, right? We brought in some very complex architectures, some very complex tools that we probably didn't need if we're honest with ourselves. Because at the end of the day, software is just a tool that we use to solve problems. It's just a tool. I was doing some Google research recently, and based on that, uh, about 70% of software projects fail. Seven in 10 software projects fail. Has anyone ever worked on a project that never saw the light of day? Never made it to, that's a lot of hands. That is, wow, 70% of software projects never see the light of day. So why do so many software projects fail? A lot of times because we have unclear requirements. We don't understand what we're building, why we're building it, or who we're building it for. Very often we have misaligned business goals. We want to really solve things with technology. We want to build things for scale and growth. But they may not be aligned with the actual business goals. And if we have to be honest with ourselves, the business is the one that's paying our big, fancy engineer salaries. So we need to make sure that the business is being served by what we're doing. And then finally, everyone's favorite topic uh, for the next 20 minutes is around complexity. A lot of times, the software itself, the technology, is just too complex. So why do we bring this in? 
Is anyone familiar with Neil Ford? Pretty renowned in the software architecture space. Um, he has this quote, and I really like it. Developers are drawn to complexity like moths to a flame, often with the same result, right? Technology by itself is already complex, right? In the early days, it feels really complex, but later on, we make it even more complex. But why do we make things more complex than they need to be? Well, there's an entire group of sponsors in the other building that are showing us the great new technologies that are available. And we want to bring those into our organizations. And so there's an opportunity for us to bring in something. We're going to try and do it. Again, some more audience participation. Who here is guilty of bringing something in that they didn't need making it too complex because they were bored? <laughs> I don't want to deploy the same CRUD application with the same Postgres database running in the same environment, right? I don't want to do it because I've done that 10 times, right? I've moved on in my career and I need to address my boredom. I wish I came up with this, I really do. I'm guilty of it, and I'm sure some of you are too. I, you don't have to raise your hand, but I encourage you to, because we are in a safe space. Who here has ever brought in something that they didn't need, making the application, the architecture, the infrastructure too complex, because they were padding their resume? Resume, yeah, we all have, right? I need to be able to say that I put GraphQL into production so that I can land my next gig. And I got to put it on my resume, and I got to be honest, but the business didn't really need that. So we bring in this complexity into the organization, and at the end of the day, it hurts the business. When we bring in this complexity, we're bringing in additional uh, contextual um, overload on the development team, we're delaying deadlines, we're pushing things back because now we're dealing with the complexity that we brought in that we didn't need to bring in in the beginning. But how do we address this? How do we bring in tools, keep us excited as developers, as engineers, and make sure we're aligning with the business goals? So when we start a new project, I like to use the rule of one. Has anybody ever heard of the rule of one? So for me, this means bringing in one new technology one new framework, one new architecture, one new database. That's it, right? We're not going to bring in microservices and a document database and GraphQL all in the same foul swoop, right? Not all in the same project. We're just going to bring in one new thing. This allows the team to learn together and bringing in that new technology. We're addressing boredom. We're potentially solving problems that we know we're going to have with new technologies but we're not being overloaded, and we're still able to deliver business value. So I want to ask if anyone's ever heard this buzzword um, and been asked to make sure that our application is able to deliver results in real time. Real time? Yeah. Who has a shared definition of what the heck real time actually means, right? On the business side, most of the time that means, hey, I want to see an updated dashboard when I uh, log in in the morning, right? 8 a.m., first cup of coffee, I want to see updated data. For engineers, real time means microsecond data distribution across the globe for all of our users that we're ever going to have. And we're going to build the system so complex so that we can solve for our definition of real time versus the business's definition of real time. So I want to share with you my first case study. Uh, so I got to join a project a few years ago, and the project had been going on for quite a while. And it was, um, we were a distributed group. We had developers and engineers across about six different time zones. So I'm here on the East Coast, and I was the one waking up last. So a lot of the developers may have been in India or in other areas of the world. And so we were dealing with a huge um, time zone difference there. What was also interesting about this project was I had about three weeks to turn it around. And this particular project 
had uh, an actual deadline, like a real deadline, like not one that was made up by a stakeholder that said, hey, we want to deliver in Q2. It was like, if we don't deliver by this date, the eight months leading up until this point are completely a waste. And so the project actually began in August. Development began, we started picking technologies, and in January of the next year is when I joined the project. And when I joined, wow, nothing was working. We had a team uh, spread across the globe. We had all sorts of technologies in place that we didn't need, and nothing was working. And we had to deliver in the beginning of February. We had three weeks. When I came into the project, I looked, and it, it was like somebody went down the AWS console like it was a sushi menu and just picked out everything. Man, we had DynamoDB, we had Kafka Streaming, we had all sorts of services I didn't know uh, AWS offered. But we did that, or the team had done that because they received guidance of, we need to build this to scale in the beginning. And these are the tools that we use to build for scale. And so they went through and they brought in all these complex technologies, all these different platform services from AWS. And in that, they had no idea how to use any of them, right? They kind of started to stitch them together. And that was their real struggle was the architecture, the infrastructure was so complex, they couldn't move forward. So we didn't have anything that was working end to end, even though the team had been working diligently for about six months. So when I came in, I went in and ripped out about 80% of what we had. We just didn't need it. We looked at how many users are we actually going to be serving, and what is the thing that we need to solve for the business to get this moving, and pulled out all the unnecessary complexity so that we could get to a place where we could actually deliver business value. So after I pulled out about 80%, re-architected everything in about a day, got everything working, flowing end to end, it was at that point that we started to see some real progress, some real traction on the project. And from there, we were able to grow the team, bring in additional developers, because the architecture that we designed then, I could draw with a couple boxes and lines, and it made sense. Developers understood what they were working on, where they kind of fit into that overall ecosystem, and they were able to start contributing. But it was because we removed the complexity, brought in simplicity, we were able to move forward. So within a week, we had data flowing through the system. By the end of the project, we were processing millions of records a day, no problem. Buzzword number two, and I know that everyone in this room has heard and been asked to make sure if the application we're building is scalable, right? Scalable. What the heck does scalable mean? Scalable for what? Right? And we're starting to hear this a lot in the work that we do. We're hearing it in a lot of the organizations that we're working in. We want to make sure our processes and our systems and all of the things are actually scalable. And so scalable is one of my favorite buzz terms. Um, because the way I think about scalability is in three ways, right? And the one way that a lot of us deal with day in and day out is how can we scale the number of users? How can we bring on more users onto the platform and give the same or better performance to those users as we grow, right? This is exciting. This is where a lot of the fun engineering challenges that we're working on day in and day out kind of come into play. There are a lot of really good patterns. There are a lot of people that we can kind of lean on to solve this particular problem. Now, one of the other ways that I think about scalability is around features. How can I add more features reliably to the platform in a way that it makes sense, that in six months I don't have to go to my CTO or to my leader and say, hey, we messed up, right? We've got to do a big refactor. We've got to do a big rewrite in order to get us there. And so we need to try again. And the last way I think about scalability is around developers. How can we add more developers to the platform? How can I add more developers across the globe that we may be communicating in completely different time zones? How can we communicate asynchronously? How can we make sure that our ecosystem is built in a way that allows a developer to join, get up to speed quickly, and start contributing to the code base? Uh, there we go. 
Right, so I kind of covered a little bit of this. Scaling users, we're adding more compute, we're adding more database capacity, and we're able to process a lot more events. Again, we've got a lot of architectural patterns and, and tools that we can do use to, to solve for this. When we scale features, we want to make sure that they, the features are, again, aligned to the business. Features are maintainable, right? And features have modularity in order so that we can move those features as we grow and scale. Because we can tr start to predict how applications are going to grow and scale, but we might not know until we start to see actual user load what areas of the application we need to grow. I want to share another case study. This was a, an opportunity that I had to work with a healthcare startup. They had just raised a big round. They were looking to hire a bunch of developers. And so they asked me to kind of come in and take a look around. Hey, where are we? What are we missing? Kind of what's going on here? Um, they had a fairly simple stack. It was a Rails stack, Postgres, running in a single AWS um, region. Nothing crazy, nothing super fancy. It was exactly what they needed. The challenge that they had was it was taking about six months for a senior level developer to put code into production. Has anybody ever spent six months trying to put code into production? Wow. Yeah, it's disheartening, right? It's, you, you join an organization, you're excited about the mission, but you can't contribute, right? Because just you're running into blocker after blocker and you're not able to contribute. And that's exactly what was happening here. They were worried about attrition, people leaving the team because they weren't actually able to contribute to the code. Uh, and a big reason that this particular group was having trouble with such a simple tech stack, with such a simple environment, was because their application looked a heck of a lot like this. It was so configurable, it was so unique that the customer service team wasn't able to accurately represent hey, this is the, what the environment looked like for this particular user. They didn't actually know. It wasn't easy for the developers to understand the code path, how data flowed through the system and through the architecture. And so because of this complexity, developers were able to confidently contribute to the code base. When we think about scaling developers, this comes into documentation, like we learned earlier. How can we document in public? How can we collaborate on documentation? How can we benefit from brand new team members joining our organization and contributing to documentation by reviewing that documentation? What does our onboarding look like? What does it take for me to give a brand new developer who has experience building software access to the GitHub and maybe a, a development environment, they can spin things up and get up and running. For me, I love to be able to have an environment where I can give a developer access to GitHub and they're running locally within 30 minutes. And I know that it's possible, but it takes a lot of effort on our part to be able to do that. I also want to make sure that we're using industry technologies. We're not using some crazy off the shelf, you know, thing that's maintained by one guy uh, on GitHub, but we're actually using industry technologies because then we have the ability to, to uh, hire, right? We know the technologies that we're using, we can go and hire for them. I know it's not as much of a thing now, but there's actually Stack Overflow answers for the problems that we have as we're encountering them. Or I can actually go to Google and get a reliable answer for what I'm searching for. I want to share one more case study. Uh, so I was working with a, a company um, a few years ago, and this group was looking to grow their engineering organization. And they wanted to make sure that they could grow around the globe. They wanted to move more towards like a follow the sun model and wanted to be able to make sure that they could lock down uh, the environment, just kind of grant access as needed for uh, individual developers that were joining. They might be project specific or they might be focused on uh, a short term contract. And so one of the big challenges here was one, how do we provide just the limited level of access that you need? How do I not give you access to everything that's in vault? 
how do I not give you the shared API keys in our Postman collection where we're using a shared login to get access to everything? Has anyone ever had that situation where everybody had access to all the API keys? Yeah, let's fix that, right? Um, but those were the scenarios that we were dealing with. And so how do we do that? How can I add an engineer to the platform, get them up and running quickly, and not give them all of the keys to the kingdom? So this was a really interesting uh, opportunity for us to look at all of the documentation, look at the systems that we have in place, look at the access controls that we have in place. How do we remove the potential for a single point of failure within the organization? Who here likes free stuff? Yeah? We're developers, right? We're engineers. We'll do anything for a t-shirt or a sticker. Um, I'd love to share my uh, technical assessment tool that I have with you. Uh, this is what I use for brand new startups and founders all the way up to large organizations, trying to identify what are the areas, what are the pain points within that organization so that we can start to mitigate it, uh, so that we can grow and scale. So if that's something that's interesting, uh, if you'd connect with me on LinkedIn, I'm happy to shoot that over to you. All right, quick reminder, software is just a tool that we use. Technology is already complex. We don't need to bring in additional complexity uh, just to fill our resumes or solve our boredom. There are other things that we can do. It's easy to build complex systems. It's actually a lot more difficult to build simple systems that all the developers and everyone in the organization can really understand. And I encourage you to focus on the problem that you're trying to solve, not just the solution that you're trying to build. Cool. Thank you all.